Hey everybody, welcome back to the Revelation Bible Study. My name is David Kenny, and I'm the pastor of Walden Community Church here in Montgomery, Texas. And we're going through the entire book of Revelation, and we are now in the middle of Revelation chapter 15. And of course, you're more than welcome to open your Bibles and begin right here with us. You can always go back and find a passage that you're uh, thinking about, and you can find that in the titles. Uh, of the videos we've posted, or you can just go back to the very beginning and start there. We'd love to have you join us. So we're here at Revelation 15, and we are, of course, watching John, and he's writing down his revelation. He's writing down the things that he is seeing in the end times. And right before uh, we got to where we are now, John saw the, the throne room. He saw the sea of glass. He saw those who uh, were triumphant, those who were victorious, uh, who didn't take the mark of the beast, who uh, had lived the, the life that God wanted them to. They are in heaven. They are holding harps and they are singing a song. And we had just got to the part where they were starting to sing. And so we're going to go through the lyrics of this song and we're going to kind of break it down and maybe ask a couple of questions. And so I'll even put the lyrics uh, up on the screen for you so that you can see uh, each kind of uh, sonnet as we get to it. The first part says, great and amazing are your deeds. You probably sang songs in church that had similar words. We talk about how great God is. We sing about how great God is. But saying that great and amazing are your deeds implies that we can call to mind, right? That we can call to mind things in our life things in the life of other people around us, or maybe even uh, events that have happened at our church, that, that we saw God's hand in. We saw God's hand move. If I were going to say, what, what are some of the deeds, what are some of the great deeds that you've seen God do? How would you answer that? Maybe you've uh, ever stared at the ocean, or stood in the middle of the desert, or stared at a tall mountain and thought those words to yourself, great and amazing are your deeds. Ironically, um, we spend more time probably questioning God, questioning the things that God does. And rather than worship him, we ask him, why? Why did you do this? Why did you do that? We should be saying, great and amazing are your deeds. It's not about what I think or don't listen to my criticism, Lord. Your, your deeds are great. Then the song says, O Lord God, the Almighty. That's three huge titles, right? Lord, God, and Almighty. What does Lord mean? Lord means master, right? Lord means master. Lord is the one who rules your life. And so if we say Jesus is Lord, well, then what does that make you? That makes you the servant. That makes you the slave. We don't like that word. We're trying to do away with words like that. But we are God's servant. This is what the Bible says. And a real servant, a, a, a servant who knows their place, obeys without question. Can we say that? Can we say that of, of Jesus and of Scripture? That, that we say that the Bible is God's word, right? And we say Jesus is Lord. Okay. Then do we obey his words? If we are God's servant, then we serve him without questioning, right? If, if, if he is Lord, then we are devoted. We are loyal. When a master says, do this, well, then the appropriate response is to obey and to obey without hesitation. Is that how we are? A Christian is someone who calls Jesus Lord, right? And for God to truly be the Lord of my life, the only correct response is I should obey. I need to stop turning a blind eye to my sin and I need to obey, even if I don't feel like it, even if I don't want to. I hope that those of you who are watching can truly say that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is the Lord of your life. The next part says, just and true are your ways. Just and true are your ways. Did you ever pray? To God and then you give God your opinion or you say you know God I, I know this is how 
it went down. And I know this is how life is, but let me just tell you what I think. Let me just tell you how I think it could have gone better. Or let me just tell you how uh, I think it could have gone better for me. Or maybe this is what you should do next time. Is that our place? To tell God how to run my life or tell God how to run the world? Tell God that he's made a mistake? This passage says, just and true are your ways. Yeah, but what about all the times that life is unfair? Guess what? We're not allowed to say that. (laughs) We're not allowed to say that. It's his world, right? It's his world and we are his creation. So whatever God does, because he is Lord, right? Then he makes the rules. This is all, this is all his. Would you ever say that God was wrong? Is that what you're, is that what you're saying when you pray those things to God? God, you were wrong. No, you, I would never say God is wrong. Okay. If God is not wrong, then I'm wrong, right? I'm wrong. We need to be able to say just and true are your ways. The things that God does are just and they are true because he is Lord. Then it says, O king of the nations. Some some translations even say king of the ages, right? As if to say that God has always been king. For a million years before the earth began, God was king. God was king before there were people to worship him. And God will be king a million years from now. This is why us reasoning with God or us telling God how to do things is ridiculous. You know, if you've ever argued with your kid and your kid says, why? You always say, because I said so, right? And in your head, you're thinking, I've lived life longer than you. I've seen life. I know how life goes. You need to trust me, right? And then we do it to God the same way. We look up and we say, God, why? And God says, look, you're only 80 years old. (laughs) You don't know how life goes. God says, I'm eternal. I've been around for billions of years. So we, we should... Stop trying to tell God how to run the show. That's, that's stupid, right? We are, we are a speck of dust. The Bible says that you are missed. Your life is missed compared to God. Verse 4 says, Who will not fear, O Lord, and glorify your name? That's a real question. Who will not fear? In other words, who could look at all of this majesty that we've just read about and, and not fear God? Who in their right mind could look at the holy God, look at the all-powerful God, the all-knowing God, the God of the nations, the God of the ages, and say, I'm not afraid. Yeah, I'm not afraid. Who, who could walk around with their head held high and think of themselves more highly than they should? No, nobody, right? It says, who will not fear? That's almost, uh, you know, it's a question that doesn't even have an answer. Who wouldn't glorify your name? That's what we should be doing. This holy, perfect, almighty God who is just and true, we should be bringing more glory to his name. Our our lives should give God credit. Our lives should glorify God. Instead, we build up our own lives. We know we make up our own uh, credibility. We, We do things to advance our own life, but rather our lives should be spent bringing God more glory. It says, for you alone are holy. You alone. It says, you alone are set apart. You alone are worthy. Nobody else. Nobody else is set apart. Nobody else is special. Just God. All nations will come and worship you for your righteous acts have been revealed. You know, the Bible says that one day every knee will bow and every tongue confess. But you know what? That will only happen because it's forced to. People will kneel and bow and confess because they're forced to. They will come face to face with a God that their brain can't wrap their head around and they will fall down in fear because they're forced to. All nations will come and worship you, yes, one day, but they won't have a choice. And right now, before all this happens, you and I and those around us, our family members, our friends, our neighbors, our co-workers, they still have a choice until the end. And it's right here in verse 15. After this, I looked and the sanctuary of the tent of witnesses in heaven was opened. And out of the sanctuary came the seven angels with the seven plagues, clothed in pure, bright linen with golden sashes around their chests. 
And one of the four living creatures gave to the seven angels seven golden bowls full of the wrath of God who lives forever and ever. And the sanctuary was filled with smoke from the glory of God and from his power, and no one could enter the sanctuary until the seven plagues of the seven angels were finished. I don't know if you got an Isaiah vibe from reading that, but that is a, a mirror of what Isaiah sees in his vision of Isaiah chapter 6. Go read Isaiah chapter 6 and, and look at how similar they are. In uh, Isaiah 6, God's throne room is revealed. Isaiah says he sees God's, uh, the train of his robe filling the temple and, and the throne room fills with smoke and the creatures begin to worship God. And here we see seven angels. Now seven is the number of perfection in the Bible. Seven is the number of completion. And this is the completion of judgment, the completion of God's wrath. And these angels are wearing robes with sashes. So they have this appearance of being judges, right? And they are given God's final judgments. These are the last judgments to be poured out on the earth. Like I said, we still have time. You and I, we can be saved from this. We can be part of that heavenly choir that sings this song in heaven, holding those lamps, holding those harps. <clears throat> but you can be saved from this. You know, we can be part of that heavenly choir. We can be one of those who sing this song. We can be one of those who holds the harps and stands by the sea of glass. That's good news. Those who have to go through the judgment, bad news. And the Bible calls the good news the gospel. The gospel is an easy story to tell. And you can say it just by saying your ABCs. A is admit. You admit that you're a sinner. And there's no shame in that. There isn't. Usually uh, we, we are embarrassed when we do something wrong. And we don't like to admit that we've done something wrong. But the first part of following Christ is admitting that you don't measure up. He is holy, right? He alone is holy. So I am not. And heaven is not a reward for perfect people. If it were, nobody would go. Romans 3 says, all have sinned and continue to fall short of God's glory. And even once you become a Christian, you're still not perfect and you never will be. But you belong to a group of people. You belong to a church. You belong to the universal church. You belong to every other Christian. And together we are a family. Together we are brothers and sisters united in Christ. And yes, none of us are perfect, but we are forgiven. And we are a group who believes that Jesus was God's son. If you believe in Jesus, if you believe he came and walked among us, that he was God in human flesh, he was born of a virgin, died a perfect life on a cross, gave his blood for you, you can be saved. That belief in Jesus is the key. Acts 4 says there is no salvation in anyone else. There's no other faith. There's no other religion. There's no other branch. There's no other offshoot of Christianity that can save you. It's only Christ. There's no other name under heaven by which people can be saved. And so, if you can admit your sin and you can believe in Christ, then the Bible says we just confess it. We say it out loud. We confess those things. We confess. The Bible says in Romans 10, if you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, right? That Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. That's the good news. Nothing added, nothing taken away. It's as simple as that, and that, that new life is available to you. And if that sounds like something you'd like, then I would invite you to bow your head and pray this prayer. Dear God, thank you for sending your son, Jesus, so that I could be your child. And thank you for loving me Thank you for being with me all my life, even when I didn't know it. I realize that I need a savior to set me free from my sin and from myself, from all my bad habits, from all my hurts and my hangups, those things that mess up my life. I ask you to forgive me of my sin. Remove my darkness. I want your light to shine within me. 
I want to repent and turn from that old way of life and walk towards the way that you've created me to live. Be the Lord of my life. Save me with grace. Each and every day, I want to learn to love you more, trust you more, and become more of who you made me to be. Thank you for creating me. Thank you for choosing me to be in your family. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I would invite you to plug into a local church. Tell a group of believers that you accepted Christ. And then walk with that body. Walk with that church. Use your gifts and talents to serve them as they minister and serve you. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Bye.